Thank you. Um, so just to summarize uh, what we did yesterday, we ended with the algebraic beta ansatz, which was about finding eigenvectors of the transmatrix T of Z. And just to clarify, because maybe the notation was a bit confusing, uh, some people asked me what, what, what this A sub zero of Z was, so I moved the subscript to a superscript to make it clear that this is just an ordinary function. It was just a convenient shorthand. So if A superscript zero of Z is A of Z to the L, D superscript of Z is B of Z to the L, these are just numbers, right? Um, and then you, you write those beta equations in terms of these two functions and A and, well, in this case, just A, which is this uh, Boltzmann weight of, of, the, of the model in its usual spectral parameter uh, parameterization. Uh, then the claim is that if the Z, ZJ satisfy for all J uh, the set of um, algebraic equations, then psi defined uh, in the, by this beta ansatz is actually an eigenvector of T of Z. And in fact, we know what the eigenvalue is. It's also some expression, some rational function in Z, but as you saw in one of the exercises, it's, it should actually be realized that this is actually a polynomial in Z, uh, at least a Laurent polynomial in Z. So there is some pole cancellation taking place, and that's exactly what the beta equations take care of. Anyway, so we're not gonna go into the actual analysis of these equations, because you still need to solve them, and, and in principle, they're very complicated equations, but the nice thing is that in the limit where the size of the system L goes to infinity, uh, you can definitely determine the ground state eigenvector, which corresponds to the largest uh, eigenvalue of the transfer matrix, and that means uh, you can, um, you can um, determine the thermodynamic <coughs> properties. So that's what's upstairs. But I realized I forgot also there's something else I drew here, which I guess I did not, not explain yesterday. So before we go on to describe the phase diagram, let me also mention the, this picture here. Th this is something I should have drawn yesterday. Uh, it's just another way of expressing the same identity here. Um, it's saying you start from the plus 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 state, which in terms of path is just the completely occupied uh, state, and then you apply a series of B operators. And remember that these B, you can think of them as basically kind of like transfer matrices, except the boundary conditions are a bit unusual. It's an empty edge at the left and an occupied edge at the right. And so the effect is that you know at each row, of, so there are exactly M rows here, as opposed to L uh, columns, where L is less than equal to less or equal to L. And then the result is some of the paths end up going some, in some way, maybe, uh, you know, like this one goes here, uh, this one goes here, maybe this one goes here, and maybe there's a surviving path that, that comes out here. So this is, the, this is another way of thinking of how the B operators act, how they kill one path every, every row, and, and the final state, the output, if you like, which has the entries of this vector psi, can be read off on the, in, the, on the, in, the, in the top row. So it's just another way of just visualizing the, uh, the same object. But um, it doesn't obviously help with the actual derivation of the beta equations, so that's why I did not insist too much on it uh, yesterday. Um, but we'll get back to that picture uh, pretty soon. Uh, so, but before we go on, as I said, let's talk a little bit of the, about the phase diagram. The phase diagram is very easy. It depends un entirely only on the parameter delta. So remember that our Boltzmann weights um, are given in terms of Q and Z, but Q is the same as um, delta, because delta is Q plus Q inverse over two. And really, the spectral parameter plays no role in the physics of the model, so to speak. So the only relevant parameter is delta. And there are three situations. Either if you assume that delta is real, so that all the Boltzmann weights are, say, positive, then either delta is less than minus 1 or delta is in between um, minus 1 and 1 or delta is greater than 1. There are, of course, limiting, limiting cases. But as I said, I always exclude uh, in what I'm talking about uh, the limiting cases. Uh, this is the anti-ferroelectric regime. And this is the one that was also briefly addressed in one of the exercises. That's the one where at least where delta is sufficiently negative, um, the dominant contribution um, is given by an alternation of errors. Errors are being anti-parallel, so this is this anti-ferroelectric regime. It's um, mass, so it's, it has a gap, so um, it's, um, not, it's not critical. Um, there is the disordered regime. So this is denoted by AF on this picture. So this picture is just showing you uh, the, the different phases as a function of A on, on C and B on C, because remember, only ratios of Boltzmann weights are relevant. So this is the disordered regime, denoted by D on the picture. Um, this is, so this, these are the lines delta equals one, delta equals minus one. I also sh showed just for fun the uh, delta equals zero, which is a circle here. So some, somehow, all the intermediate values are in curves inside that central region. 
So this is a critical region. This is the most interesting one physically. Uh, that's the one, by the way, where Q is of modulus one, whereas the other two cases are the cases where Q are real. Um, so there's a lot to be said about uh, this region. You can, you can consider the uh, conformal limit. There's plenty of interesting things to say physically, but I don't really want to talk about it today. And finally, the, the most boring region is the ferroelectric region, which is a completely frozen region, which means uh, there, are, there are no local degrees of free, freedom. Uh, that means the correlation length is strictly zero and uh, nothing interesting happens, basically. Yes? Loops of, of what? Like the path. Okay. Um, so they're not really loops because the problem is the uh, the path can only go north and east. So I don't think there's much. I mean, their their length is pretty much constrained to be the whole size of the system. I don't think there's much to be said. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it, but not obviously. Um, right. So the ferroelectric region is these two regions, and basically there's a, you know essentially as I said there, there's a ground state and nothing else. Everything else is really far away. It's too too, too energetically. Um, expensive to actually go into. So, um, so this is the, uh, the phase diagram. I should also maybe just point out quickly, um, though uh, we, we have, so maybe just a small remark before we go on. Uh, we, in principle, you can consider more general Boltzmann weights of the form, say, A1, B1, C1, C2, B2, A2, which means you can break, um, suppose you break the parity and, and, and just take general Boltzmann weights that satisfy the S rule. Um, this is sometimes called the six vertex model in, in a field. Uh, you can perform the, to some extent, the same analysis for the six vertex model in a field. Uh, it's harder to get explicit results. You, don't, you can't express analytically the free energy as a function of all these um, uh, fields, but at least you can do a qualitative analysis and, or numerical analysis of the beta equations and so on. And so you have a similar description in, in a field where you also have the three phases uh, disordered antiferroelectric and ferroelectric. So, so the, the, the analysis is more complicated, but the basic structure into the three phases persists. So, um, yeah. Anyway, this is all, all stuff which has been done years ago. Um, so what I want to do next is um, do a little bit of combinatorics. This is what, and in particular, get, get, get eventually connect to a symmetric polynomials. So for that, we're going to do, so, so we're going to forget about these periodic boundary conditions in some sense and uh, talk about domain wall boundary conditions. So this is the end of the uh, sort of diagonalization of the trans matrix, which we haven't actually done, but you know, which could be done using the algebraic beta ansatz. And now I want to talk about domain wall boundary conditions, um, which pretty much will keep us busy for the whole of today. And hopefully we get some yeah, fun combinatorics related to that. We should talk about alternating sign matrices and maybe even domino tilings, depending on the time. So what, what is the domain wall boundary conditions? It's just uh, another choice of boundary conditions which are fixed. So it, it completely falls into the framework of what we've been doing so far. In fact, it's very closely, it's very similar to these um, beta states. It's, it's the one where you choose the boundary conditions as follows. So you fix an integer n greater than zero. And unfortunately, my convention is, is for the domain wall boundary conditions are the opposite of the ones for beta states. I, uh, in, so that means I actually choose the, the bottom to be entirely empty rather than occupied. And yes, it's annoying, but okay, that's the way it is. Um, of course, there's parity anyway, so you can feel free to exchange all occupied with empty and the same. There'll be the, um, um, okay, no, so I said empty. Um, yeah, empty, empty. Uh, it would be, of course, exactly the same, but my conventions for some reason are this way. So empty on the bottom and the right, and everything occupied on the left and top. So, so once again, this is a square lattice. That means there are n, uh, okay, maybe n is not so, maybe I should use l because I've been using l all this time. Sorry, let me change my mind. It's gonna be l. Oh no, because it's gonna be confusing. All my notes says with n, sorry. Yeah, n. Anyway. Um, so it's a square lattice of size n, where n used to be l. Um, and, and you can see that in particular, this satisfies the ice rule because there are indeed n incoming paths on the left and they have to go, and there are n outgoing paths on the right, so on the top, so everything is fine. 
it would not make sense for a rectangular lattice because we would break the uh, ice rule. And um, in principle, you can define the partition function of this model, which is just as usual, you know, the sum of Boltzmann weights um, in the usual way. So the sum of, you know, A number of vertices of type A, um, B number of vertices of type B, and so on. And C number of vertices of type C. Um, now, immediately what we want to do is, we, we, you know, we want to use this integrability that's, that's underlying this model. And um, um, that means we're going to make it um, inhomogeneous, so to speak. So what do I mean by that? I mean that immediately what I want to do is actually introduce parameters x1, x2, dot, 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 xn attached to each line. And as usual, um, and y, y1 up to yn attached to each column, and, and, and as usual, the rule now is that actually, so this is the sort of homogeneous, if you like, uh, partition function that I usually want to generalize it to some of the product of um, the weight. Um, so, you know, let's write it symbolically, W of, um, so am I right that the columns are, yeah, uh, yeah. I should probably also keep the same convention. Uh, the rows are the, yeah, correct. Um, w of xi over yj, product over ij equals one to n. And now, uh, where this time w is as usual a, b, or c, depending on, on, depending on the configuration of the vertex at uh, row i and column j, right? So, so it's the usual rule. You know, we're always giving a weight which, which depends on the ratio of the, uh, the row by the column. And, um, Uh, so so if, you, if you want to recover the actual original problem, it's easy. You just say that Z homogeneous is obtained by, set, by taking Z and then evaluating all the uh, XIs to be some fixed number X and all the YJs to be some fixed number Y. So it's just a specialization of this more, more general object. And the point is that this object, you know, it, it, you've introduced a lot of extra parameters, but you can play with them. You can do elementary commutative algebra. And, and this is a game that originally Karepin did many years ago. So the reason he was interested in, in, in this particular partition function with these special boundary conditions is he was actually interested in computing correlation functions. But you can, be in, you can just consider this as a problem in its own uh, right, you know, computing this partition function. And as it turns out, it has lots of interesting uh, uh, connections to many different things. Um, so here's, the, so here's the, the beginning of the analysis. This is what Kuripin did many years ago. He said, well, we don't really know how to compute this. A partition function, but maybe we can write sufficiently many conditions to uniquely determine it. And, and he noticed the following. Uh, he's, he noticed that actually they are uniquely determined by a series of uh, uh, um, uh, recurrence relations. So maybe I should also put a little index, oops, uh, because it's going to be a recurrence relation on the size of the system, so might, might as well put an N write this z sub n. And he noticed that you have the following, so you have first, you have initial stage of the recurrence, which is that z1, this is the one by one, not terribly interesting, um, partition function that's just a vertex of type c, and c with our conventions is always q minus q inverse. So that's the beginning of, of the recurrence relation. And now the point is that um, we're going to write some, uh, some more properties of Zn. So the next property is that um, Zn as a function of uh, the x's and the y's. So what is it? Every Boltzmann weight, Boltzmann weight is a Laurent polynomial in x's and y's. Um, and it's actually a symmetric uh, Laurent polynomial separately in the x's and the y's. So let me write it and then prove it. Is a symmetric, uh, let me just say for now, yeah, okay, Laurent, symmetric function for now. No, Laurent polynomial, whatever. Um, in the x's and the y's, and I'll, I'll be more specific about the degree in a second, but in the x's, well, in the x's, and then the same statement in the y's. So that means th the two statements are true, but separately, not, not together. In fact, we'll get back to that. So what am I saying? I'm saying that supposedly if I permute two x's, this, the result's supposed to be the same. So there are different ways you can prove that. Um, either, so the, the, the proof can go either directly graphically or 
uh, by using algebraic beta ansatz. So if you use the algebraic beta ansatz, let, let's, let's do one and the, the other just for fun. Um, you rewrite this Zn as being, uh, let me not write all the arguments explicitly, uh, with the exact same formalism I use, uh, we use here except for the sad fact that I'm using C operators rather than B operators, uh, you can write this as a bracket of um, plus 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 times C of, Z, C of x1 dot 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 C of xn uh, times, um, I guess, minus, 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 minus. Um, and, and now you can show where, where these C operators are basically just the one row transmetrics with these boundary conditions. And then you can, you can show by using uh, the, uh, the, the relations of the young extra algebra that the C commute between themselves. And if they commute, um, that means uh, you can freely change these things and it's a symmetric polynomial. And that works for the X's, but obviously it's gonna work for the Y as well if you just rotate the picture in some sense. But rather than do that, let's just do it directly on the picture. It's more uh, fun. Um, so second proof. And this one obviously works exactly the same for the rows and columns, which is of course the same secretly as, as using the Young-Baxter algebra. And the, really, the, 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 the proof is quite simple. Um, you just say that it costs nothing to introduce an extra R matrix here, because that all it does here is just, in, because, because these two paths are empty, automatically these, the, these two paths have to go through and be empty as well. So, so if you, you've only changed the partition function by multiplying them by A weight, by doing this. So, so the second proof, if you like, and um, is, I'll just say it in word, insert a um, extra R matrix between two rows, doesn't matter which ones, Xi plus one Xi. Um, note that it all it does is multiply, all it does is multiply a Z and by A of Xi over Xi plus one. And then use the young baxter equation to move it all the way to the left and then remove it. You know, it's one of those stories. You put something and then you remove it in the end. Voila, magic, nothing has happened. So when, once you move it all the way to the left, all that's happened is the two rows have been sw swapped and you recover exactly the same weight A at the other end. Then remove uh, at the other end. after applying the Ambaxter equation, basically. And if you do that, you get back to your original partition function, but the rows have been swapped, and so you're saying that it's, it's symmetric under the exchange of two variables, and therefore by exchange of any number of variables by, because any permutation is a composition of elementary transpositions. And this argument clearly is completely row column agnostic. You can play the exact same game, but instead using uh, columns. Okay, so that's a very important property which makes it, you know, this object much simpler. It's actually a symmetric, uh, say, Laurent polynomial. And we know a little bit more, actually. We know what its degree is and so on, so let's, let's do that. Um, right, so it's a bit annoying because I have these Laurent polynomials, so how about I get rid of the um, Laurent part by multiplying by some monomial? So the second statement is that if you take x i to the power n minus one times z n, uh, this is a, okay, so I have to look it up because I'll get the degrees wrong. Most n minus one, yes. Is a polynomial of degree at most n minus one. Degree at most n minus one. Um, in xi squared, and the same is true. For, so for each x, for each i, and the same, similarly, yi, n minus one zn, is a polynomial of degree at most n minus one in each yi squared. So yeah, it's a bit annoying because, um, so this is the part where probably I should rewrite where the, the weights used to be. So remember we had a of z was um, qz minus q inverse. Uh, no, yes, z inverse, uh, b of z equals z minus z inverse, and uh, c was just uh, q minus q inverse. So the point is that each, each weight uh, is basically a, Polynomial, Laurent polynomial of, you know, which involves only terms of degree one. So if I multiply by x, so, right, so there are two things. The first thing is if, if, if I multiply this thing by z, then it's actually a polynomial in, in, so let me do that, let me do immediately. Really, everything is a function of z squared, but for stupid reasons, I'm kind of forced to um, uh, keep those, that's floating around. So, so 
the, the naive version of that is to say that if you, if you do x i to the power n times that n, this is exactly the same as including in the Boltzmann weight of the row i an extra factor of basically, uh, you know, x i. And that becomes actually, so this is clearly a polynomial of um, degree at most n in, uh, in x i squared, because using basically the, this reasoning. What is a little bit more annoying is to realize that it's actually only of degree n minus one and not of degree n. So let me tell you why this is true. This is a fun fact. When you look at such a configuration, so let me remove again um, this, uh, you let's get back to the original picture, you realize that the path always have to, so at each row, one path has to turn somewhere. So maybe I should have drawn a particular configuration. So you notice that in, on, in each row, and in fact in each column, you always have at least one place where a path turns. And it's not very hard to convince yourself that this has to happen, otherwise you know, the path, the path can't go where they need to go. So a turn, remember, is like a C weight, but the C weight has degree, um, well, basically does not depend on, on Z, you know, once you've removed those, okay, it's really annoying, there's these monomials floating around, but if you think about it, the fact that there's a C weight means actually the degree is one less than it, than it should be. So that's why you have a degree, a polynomial of degree n minus one and not the, the naive guess, which would be of degree n, basically. It's, it's a bit annoying, so how about we just, uh, you know, you just believe me that this is true. And so why is this important? Well, because a polynomial um, of degree, of a certain degree, a polynomial of degree n minus one is entirely determined by its values at n points. So that means all we need to do now is just uh, find um, equations that fix um, Zn as a function of each of the variables x or y at n different points, and then we're done. We say that, that therefore it's uniquely fixed. And so that's what uh, Kurepin did. He's, he, he found that there, there are actually recurrence relations, um, which uh, I'll write now, but okay, I can't take my computer. Okay, so I should have chosen another board because I'm gonna have to walk a lot. Um, and so the final statement is we have recurrence relations. Um, so Zn evaluated at, uh, okay, so I really, So I guess I chose the, um, the y's to be equal to the, okay, so y1 equals x1, sorry, the other way around, um, is equal to a big product, okay, yeah. Um, okay. I mean, the exact form is not so important, of course, but I might as well write the correct equations. Um, So I habitually choose one variable y and set it equal to a variable x. And so you might say this is not enough. I need to roll it in, in n different spots. But for now, let's just do th this particular case. Uh, no, wait, that doesn't. Um, yeah, there's a q minus q inverse missing, first thing. Uh, yeah, I think everything else is fine, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I need to check really quickly. Yeah, um, and so the reason, so what's the trick? The trick is as follows. Suppose you evaluate y1 to be equal to, to x1. So remember, so x1 is, and y1 are sitting here, and you're saying, um, well, hopefully if I got the picture, that's the other thing is I have to check, yes. Um, so, if you set x1 equals y1, something interesting happens at this vertex, which is where the weight is in terms of x1 over y1. So that means the local, local Boltzmann weights at this vertex are a of one, which is whatever it is. b of one and well, c of one is always the same, but the interesting thing is b of one is actually zero. 
that means you can't have a B vertex here. If you can't have a B vertex, that means that line, like on this example, can't go through. It has to actually make a turn. So that means this example is a bad example for what I want to explain. So I'm going to re redo it. This path has to go this way. And then all the other, and then there's nothing left here. Everything is empty. And therefore, you have empty, empty, empty everywhere. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, correct. Empty everywhere here. So it, the, the trick is that basically it freezes this whole um, region, but it also freezes this whole region because now you have two paths going in, so this path keeps, keeps going all the way until it reaches the top. And so the result is that you get back to a partition function once, one size smaller, um, which is the partition function in which you erased the first row and the first column. And so the only region that, where something interesting happens is now this region, and that's exactly the partition function one size smaller. Uh, the picture is not yet fit. Yeah. So I should have an example that actually works, but uh, yeah, I think this is. Uh, uh, no, there's something wrong here because the example is no good. But all um, oh, right, right. So this example is no good. Yeah, here we go. So everything else is empty, basically. So at the end of the day, if you, so as I said, you have to, of course, take care of the fact that this first row and first column still, still have a Boltzmann weight, which is fixed, and you have to pull it out of the, uh, of the expression, and that's, that's how you get all these factors. So believe me, this is the C weight. These are the, the weights of the row and column, and so you get this expression. And now if you combine all these informations together, you realize that, of course, you know how to, what y on is at x1, but remember that this is actually a symmetric polynomial of the indexes and the y's, which means you also know it at x2, x, and so on, all of the way to xn. So effectively, you know zn, say, at all. So which implies zn is known at y1 equals xn, but also x2, oh, sorry, x1, all the way to xn. So it's known at n, n different value. It's a polynomial of degree n minus 1 in the squared variables, and therefore it's uniquely determined. So so that was the idea is that, well, we don't know what it is, but at least we know we have a formula that, you know, a recurrence formula that in principle fixes it entirely. So, you, you know, in, in practice, if, you, if, you're, if you're not very, uh, you know, if you knew nothing, what you could do is just apply uh, the uh, uh, La La Lagrange interpolation formula and just, you know, get your polynomials in size one, two, three, and so on. And you would get a mess, of course, if you do it this, did it this way, but it would work. Sorry, say it again. Uh, it's, well, y1 is equal to x1. So once you substituted y1 as equal to x1, I mean, I could write it as y1 if you prefer, but yeah, so it doesn't matter, actually. All right, now the surprising fact, which is due to uh, Isergin, is that, that there is actually a very simple closed form for that n. And of course, the, the trick is to actually find the expression, because once you have the expression, it's very easy to see that it satisfies all these conditions. And so, um, Isergin found that there is a solution to these equations in terms of a determinant, um, which is as follows. So again, unfortunately, I'll have to, if I want to get all the prefactors right, not terribly interesting, but. Okay, there's a bunch of prefactors which are not so important, which are whatever they are. In the denominator, you essentially have something which is the Vandermann determinant um, in some squared form. 
And then the important and interesting bit is that it's an, a determinant. And again, let me check. Um, xj over xi. xj over yi. Okay. And the denominator is just trivial. It's a Q minus Q inverse. So this is a square matrix of size um, n. And um, so the statement, the, the claim, which was made by Zergen, which, when, once you know it's, it's very easy. You know, once, once, once you have this formula, you can just check literally all these properties one by one. So for example, the fact that it's a polynomial just uh, is due to the fact that every pole you have inside the determinant is canceled by one of these prefactors. They have been carefully chosen so to be exactly of the same form. Um, the, the, the degree is kind of obvious from the expression. And the only not real one is the recurrence relation, but even that's very easy because when you have a determinant, you can expand it along rows and columns, and so you get very easily recurrence relations for the determinants, and the, you get immediately the correctness of the determinant uh, recurrence formulas. Um, again, the, the, also, yeah, the other property I haven't mentioned is the symmetry, but again, this is completely obvious because the determinant is Q-symmetric under the exchange of two variables, and the denominator is also basically uh, Q-symmetric under the exchange of the variables. So all the properties are easy to check, so I'm not going to do it now. You can do it as an exercise. And because these properties are supposed to uniquely determine Zn, therefore this, uh, this, uh, this is, a, if you like, a, a theorem. All right, so, so this expression is really interesting and now we're gonna play a little bit with um, what we can do with this. Um, let me skip a few things that I don't, probably don't have time to say. Yeah. Um, now, you remember that at the end of the day, we're really interested in the, in the, orig the original problem involved just the, this homogeneous situation where all the x's and all the y's are maybe equal to some fixed number so that all the Boltzmann weights are equal, this kind of homo homogeneous situation. There's, there's a bit of a problem here, which is that this expression, unfortunately, is of the form zero divided by zero. Um, if you set all the x's and y's equal, because you see that the, this matrix become all its rows and columns become equal, and similarly the denominator has a whole bunch of zeros as soon as two of the x's or two of the y's are zero. So there is still a slightly non-trivial problem, which is which is to take the homogeneous limit, but that's that's actually not so bad. What happens is that the the zeros of course cancel, and um, the the result is actually quite simple. If you call this expression phi of um, x, so I always forget which one, y, x, j, y, i, I guess. I may have switched my i's and j's. I, I was trying to be consistent, but I guess, yeah, the i's and j's got switched at some point. Oh, well. Anyway, uh, if, you, if you call this function inside the uh, um, determinant phi, then you find that z homogeneous uh, is nothing but essentially the same prefactor, which I uh, in the numerator, which I don't, don't really write, write, write explicitly again. So this kind of some prefactor, which is essentially just this one. And then you get the following. You get the determinant of, uh, so let me get it right. Um, right. So let's see. I see, right, I, I need a little bit more notation. Uh, okay, this is gonna take too long to write. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I should skip the explicit form, which is not so important. Um, so basically what you get, but it's not, okay, so let, let me write it as a psi. Um, okay, so yeah, let me just write the, the general form rather than the explicit expression, which is not so important for purposes because we're not gonna do the analysis. Um, Well, psi is essentially the same as, as phi, but uh, made into a single variable notation. So yeah, let, let me not say psi and phi are closely related, let's just say. Psi is roughly the same as phi, but in a, in a one variable notation. So anyway, the point is you, you can still take the limit inside the determinant and you get this kind of structure. 
So we, we're not going to do the actual analysis. That would take us too much time. But the point is, once you have such a determinant, uh, you can actually compute exactly its uh, um, um, large n limits. So the most interest, the part we're most interested in, uh, is the large n limit. And because I want to say a little bit about some qualitative results about what happens uh, in this uh, situation. So the uh, large n limit uh, of um, Zn homogeneous uh, was investigated in a series of papers, first by uh, Kurepin and myself, um, by myself, and then also later by uh, Blehar. Uh, so this was non-rigorous. Uh, this is, uh, this was uh, rigorous mathematically. Um, uh, and the conclusion is that you can compute explicitly the free energy, which is as usual the limit, when in this case n goes to infinity of the volume, which is one over n squared divided by log of z. So maybe let, let me denote the domain rule boundary conditions. And the interesting fact is that this free energy is actually different than the free energy you get from the, the computation of the periodic boundary conditions we mentioned earlier. So this is actually strictly less than FPBC for, well, let's say less equal, but generally, except in the um, for electric phase, which is trivial, uh, it's actually strictly less. So let me just write strictly less not to be too, um, certainly in the disordered region, this is true. Um, so that means something interesting happens. Um, and the model is actually, okay, right. So I should point out the fact that the, um, yeah, the so the calculation can be done separately in the three regimes. Uh, the easiest one, as I said, is the uh, ferro electric re regime where the uh, nothing interesting happens. The, the disordered regime is the one I did with Kurepin. It's very easy to compute, and you already get something very interesting. And the, the anti ferro electric regime is the more complicated one where you have some complicated oscillating behavior in the asymptotics, but you can still work it out. And in all these, well, in all phases except the uh, parallelic phase, we get some behavior that's actually different than that of the periodic variant conditions. And the explanation I provided at the time was that probably the six vertex model suffers, suffers from a certain dependence on boundary conditions, which are due to the constraints imposed by the ice roll, basically. And in particular, there is no thermodynamic in the usual sense, which we kind of already mentioned a few times. And this is all very similar to, to, to behavior that the combinatorialists had observed in uh, random tilings and in uh, plane partitions, dimer models. So there was clearly something to be understood there. And uh, I, I suddenly did a lot of numerical work at the time, so maybe I want to sh show you a few pictures to show you what goes on. Oh. Ah. Wait, that's not my computer. <laughs> let's, let's switch it. Ah, right. So I just want to show you a few pictures. Um, so this is all stuff that we just dis discussed. I'm not going to go over it again. But um, right. So for example, this is a uh, picture of a r r uniformly randomly generated um, uh, configuration of the domain world. Uh, so domain world under configuration. Uh, as this, by the way, if you're interested, was produced using a coupling from the past. So co coupling from the past works in a r wide range of uh, values of the parameters A, B, C. But here I cho chose them to be all equal to 1. That means we're just taking the flat distribution, so uniform distribution on all domain world boundary uh, condition uh, um, configurations. And what you find is clearly that this is not completely random. There's something going on there, which is that the path, instead of being kind of uniformly distributed the way. So if you, if you considered periodic boundary conditions, you'd expect all the, all, every region of, the, uh, of your torus to be uniformly, uh, you know, uh, the density of path in every region to be uh, constant. And here you can see clearly that the corner, southeast corner is completely empty. The north, northwest corner is completely full. Also the north, yeah, northeast and southwest corners are equally uh, trivial in the sense that all lines go through horizontally. And then there's a region in the middle where things, interesting things happen. So what you, you observe is a fa spatial phase transition where you have a certain uh, ra roughly round region in the center which is in the disordered phase and all four corners are actually in the uh, frozen ferroelectric phase. 
Um, this behavior persists if you take other values of the parameters. That I call, call zero will get back to is a very special point where we actually know exactly that the curve here is a circle. Um, um, minus one half, you get something else. Uh, by now, of course, all these curves have been determined uh, analytically and in some cases actually rigorously. There's in fact a recent preprint I haven't had time to look at which um, has some rigorous results about that. But at the time, certainly, uh, none of these curves were known exactly. The, the, the curve separating the different regions. Um, if you go to low, in the entire electric re region, it gets, uh, oops, um, the, the curve becomes more like a rectangle. And if you really look, if you could see carefully, you would realize that the inside is also, the, there's a little island of entire electric region inside. So there are actually three different phases here, but it's not so clear on the numerical simulations. But this has been established later by more precise numerical simulations. Um, if, you, if you choose A and B to be different, that means you break the rotational symmetry, you get an ellipse instead of a circle. That's also known rigorously for a delta equal zero. And you know, in various other shapes where all, all kinds of values of uh, A, B, C, I don't know, I've played, okay, yeah, I guess I played around quite a bit. So by now, of course, all these curves I know not exactly. That was the point of this talk I gave a while ago. But um, uh, when I st first started in this business 20 years ago, we certainly didn't know what these limiting curve curves were. All right, so that's a small, um, um, right, so how do I turn on this again like this? Yeah, so that was it. <laughs> uh, that's all I wanted to show. A few pictures to uh, kind of motivate why this is kind of an interesting problem. Um, So another reason we might be interested in, in uh, doing this is the application to alternating time matrices. So the next thing we're going to talk about is ASMs, and, and there will be a bit of sure functions there already, even though most of the sure functions and sure polynomials in this, this series of lectures will be tomorrow. I already want to show you that already at this stage we have some sure polynomials lurking in the background. So let me talk a little bit about ASMs. Uh, I mean by that alternating sign matrices. So first, what is an alternating sign matrix? Um, pro possibly some of you already know this st story, but uh, since it's kind of an yeah, entertaining story, I want to tell it anyway. So an ASM, in short, um, is a uh, square matrix uh, with entries uh, in zero plus or minus one, such that um, um, so what's the most compact uh, variation of the uh, definition? Um, ignoring uh, zeros, ignoring the zeros on each row and each column, there is an alternation. Uh, so pl pluses and minuses, plus ones and minus ones alternate. Um, plus ones and minus ones uh, alternate, um, starting with a plus, uh, plus one and ending with a plus one. Starting with plus and ending with plus one. So this is a very compact definition, but it's better to sh see it on an example. Um, let's do all the, the n equals three uh, ASM. So example and n equals three. So first, any permutation matrix is an ASM. So let, let me do quickly all the permutation matrices. There are six of them. Um, it's going to be long. Uh, One, two, three, four, five. I'm still missing the anti-diagonal one. So clearly these satisfy all the properties. On each row there's a single one, which is indeed an alternation of plus ones and minus ones, where which end and starts with the plus one, because that's all there is. So the only notary case in n equals three is the, um, is the following uh, one minus one. The, the one which has a single minus one, and it's this one. So that's the kind of interesting one. So you have a minus one in the middle, and so you can see here you have an alternation of one minus one, one. And that's it. Um, so there are, in this case, seven of them. Um, so they, there's a long history associated to this uh, problem. 
Um, in particular, the, uh, this is the story of the alternating sign matrix conjecture, which you can read. There's a book written about this by Bressou. Uh, here, all I care about is the following very simple fact, which was first observed by uh, Kupperberg. Uh, is that um, uh, there is a bijection between um, between ASMs of size n and uh, six vertex configurations of size n, the domain wall and domain wall boundary condition uh, six vertex uh, configurations. So I'm using a lot of uh, abbreviations because all these words are. And the bijection is quite simple. Um, it's the easiest way to go is actually from an um, from a uh, domain wall boundary condition. Do I still have one somewhere? Well, not really. This one is a bit of a mess. So how, how about I take another example? Um, so the rule is quite simple. The um, each time you have a configuration of type C, which is where a path turns, you put a, either a one and a minus one, and you do it in an alternating way, reading from left to right. And the claim in this can be done consistently. Um, there are many other ways you can uh, define this bijection, but um, I'm trying to figure out if I, uh, right. So uh, I guess, okay, how about I give it in terms of arrows? So have, we haven't used arrows for a while. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. So instead of use, no, maybe path, what the heck? Yeah. Okay, so in type path, it's easy. All the configurations of type A, B, C uh, are zero, correspond to a zero, sorry. So this one, this one, this one, so I guess, yeah. And, and the empty one, uh, you, you, at, at this vertex, you put a zero. And when you have, okay, so I might as well draw the, uh, okay. Yeah, I'll just do the whole bijection properly, fine. Now I study. And so, and the C vertices, which are these vertices, so I have to figure out which one is which, one, which one is a one and which one is a minus one. And for that, I need to cheat and look because I never know. Um, with these conventions, it better be that the, yeah, there better be that this is a one, right? Because, yeah, because the, the, my boundary conditions are not invariant under this, so. So the claim is if you do that, then uh, it's actually bijection. It's not very hard to check, but you know, you, there's a bit of an exercise to, to do there. And so at, at the time, this was really important because Zeilberger had just managed to enumerate those alternating sign matrices, but it, the proof was very complicated. And Kruperberg suggested that there's a much easier way to count ASMs. First, you bijack them to six vertex domain wall boundary conditions, and then you apply this is again determinant formula. It's still not completely trivial, though. The proof is still three pages long. Um, as opposed to 80 pages, but we can still reduce it by a factor of uh, three, I think. And uh, the way you do this, because the evaluation of this determinant is still kind of, you know, you, you have to work, basically. There's an even more elementary way of uh, computing that this determinant, uh, which is due to either, uh, like, simultaneously to Okada and Stroganov, and this is what I want to talk about now. Um, so, so what are we trying to do? Let's summarize. We now have those domain world boundary conditions and we want to just enumerate them. So the enumeration means Boltzmann weights all equal to one. So A equals B equals C equals one. So, um, so, so for, for the next uh, 15 minutes, we're gonna say, we're gonna set A equals uh, B, so A equals B equals C. Of course, overall normalization doesn't matter. Uh, but with our conventions, remember, uh, we can't really set uh, them equal to one because uh, there's, yeah, there's an overall factor. So remember we had like A equals uh, QZ minus Q inverse Z inverse. Uh, oh, actually, there's an even simpler way to uh, describe this. So delta was A squared plus B squared minus C squared over two AB. And that has, happens to be one half, uh, if you think carefully. Um, and since th this was supposed to be one half of Q plus Q inverse, yeah, so let me not rewrite the explicit Boltzmann weights. We're not going to need them. Um, you have to solve this quadratic equation. You find that Q is like equal to exponential plus or minus 2 up over 3. It doesn't matter which one you choose, uh, obviously. So what we're really de dealing with is trying to compute the, um, 
the uh, partition function of the um, d domain world boundary condition six vertex model where Q, the, um, this kind of quantum parameter, is, is evaluated to be a third root of unity. So this is kind of important, and that's what, it w what will create some extra simplifications in the uh, computation. And so, um, so the, the remaining, the, what I'm going to say next is, is due to simultaneously, and as I believe independently to uh, Okada and the late Stroganov, um, which is as follows. They realized that uh, Zn is essentially just a sure function. So I'm assuming you've seen previous week sure functions, or sure polynomials, because that was the subject of one of the uh, courses, but uh, one of the course, courses last week. So l let me remind you that when you have a Young diagram of, of pet petitions, so let me define a certain petition for you. And the petition goes as follows. Um, it's a staircase petition where the steps are always of size two, one. So I'm gonna first put all the dimensions and then, uh, so the idea is quite simple. So it's made of boxes. So hopefully I get an example that kind of looks okay. Uh, yeah, the stake is, looks worse and worse as we go down, but uh, yeah, that's pretty bad. Anyway, uh, maybe I should have made a smaller example. So for example, lambda two maybe <laughs> is just uh, this one. Uh, lambda three would be, uh, uh, okay, that's probably good enough. Uh, there. So in general, it's a staircase two by one. And, uh, and I want to, we want to consider the corresponding Schur polynomial in two n variables. So S lambda n, I need to keep track of the, 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 the size, the number n, because as usual, we're gonna do recurrence relations. Um, and, and then we have two n arguments, which eventually will be identified with our x's and y's, but for now, let me just call, that to, call them that to, uh, to be uh, x, y uh, neutral. Um, so what is this? Um, there are various ways, I don't, I've, I don't know which, you probably had a bunch of di different alternative uh, characterizations of uh, um, sure polynomials. For example, one definition could be in terms of, um, terms of semi-standard Young tableaus, or maybe in terms of this uh, type of Valk character type formula. So I don't know which one um, is your favorite one. But how about we do it for now in terms of it as a determinant formula? Um, so, so the rule is quite simple. So this is true for any lambda, really. Um, Z1 on Z2n. We're supposed to take the ratio of two determinants. In the denominator, you have this Vandermond determinant. Um, no, actually, I do want to see how my subject did it. Um, sorry. Right. And then the numer numerator, you have a certain determinant. So it's uh, this determinant of z i to the power, um, ah, no, I guess I'll change my mind again. Um, lambda j plus 2n minus uh, j, ij going from 1 to 2n. And I think I got the sign wrong again, so let me fix it again. Anyway, if there's a sign wrong, you can uh, figure it out. Um, so now if we apply it to this particular example, it, it has a very characteristic structure, which is as follows. So uh, Z1 dot 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 Z2n, which is, um, so the denominator is kind of boring and I'm just gonna call it one over, oh, delta is already being used, but um, uh, V for von der Mond. So this is just, let me call this V. And the interesting part is the numerator. And so what is this structure? So because of the fact that the lambdas kind of start from, so really there's, you know, there are two ends of them and the first two are zero, the next ones are ones and so on. So if you start shifting them using this shift, you get the following. The first row is just one, one. The second row is Z1, Z2. Uh, so is it row or columns? Yeah, maybe I want to have the columns. I, I like better columns. Sorry, change of plan. Right, so the second column is uh, just the power number one, Z1, Z2, all the way to Z2n. 
But this, the third one corresponds to the place where you put a box. So each time you have an extra box, that means you have to shift the powers by one more than you expect. So that's one is z1 to the power three, z2 to the power three, dot, 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 z2 n to the power three. And then the next one is just the obvious one, z1 to the power four, z2 n to the power four. And then again, you shift you, by one and so on. So you have this simple structure which goes all the way to whichever the last one is. Uh, n minus one plus two n. Well, I, I'll let you compute what the last one is. It doesn't really matter. Um, we have this structure. Now, this uh, Schrupp polynomial satisfies a remarkable identity, which is sometimes called the, the wheel condition. Um, for people that uh, like uh, Schrupp polynomials and also McDonald polynomials, they occur all over the place. So, um, actually, so there's the following simple proposition you can prove. Whenever you have three, when the, so the evaluation, so this is a symmetric polynomial, and the claim is that when you evaluate um, S lambda n, where three of the parameters form, so, so, so what we call a wheel, which is really of the form z um, q squared z to fourth z, and yes, it's a cubic root of unity, so I could re rewrite this as just q z q. So I never know, yeah, I guess in my notes, did I? Yeah, for some reason, I always want to use q squared rather than q. Don't, don't worry about it. If q is exponential plus 2 pi over 3, q squared is exponential minus 2 pi over 3. So it doesn't really matter. Anyway, and all kinds of other parameters, and then this is 0. So that means, and remember, this is a symmetric polynomial. That means whenever three of the variables form sort of a, a equilateral triangle centered around the origin, then the evaluation is 0 for any z. And once again, this is only where q is exponential 2 pi over 3. So, you know, you, you have this little unit circle, well, well circle, sorry, not unit, and then you have z, you have q squared z, q to the power of 4z, this is zero, and the claim is that this evaluates to zero. And the, the proof is very elementary, because, um, um, well, first, by homogeneity, you can assume z equals one, it doesn't really matter. You can, so the proof is basically, by homogeneity, you can just set z equals one, so you have three arguments which are one, so now we're trying to evaluate this at one q q squared and some other uh, parameters. And when you look at the corresponding um, uh, columns, you see, so now we have, so um, um, let's see, um, no, rows. <laughs> okay, maybe I should have, maybe I had, I had a reason, that, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. So if you look at the, the rows corresponding to z1, z2, and z3, so the first row is just, so inside this big determinant, you have a row which is just once, which is the powers of z1. And then you have one, q, and then you skip one, and the next one is q cubed, sorry, q squared, and the next one is, ah, yeah, doesn't matter. Should probably have, shouldn't have done that. Anyway, the next one is q squared, and then you skip one, and the next one is q to the power of six, which is one again. So then you get one again, and then q squared, and one again, and q squared. So you have this very simple structure where you just have an alternation of one and q squared. And finally, for the last one, uh, you get one uh, q fourth, and then uh, one again, and then q fourth, and so on. And then you have a bunch of other rows. But the point is, these three I claim that these three rows are linearly dependent, and therefore the determinant is zero. Why? Because if you multiply this one by one, this one by uh, um, q squared, and this one by q fourth, because of the fact that it's the third root of unity, I claim that the sum of these three things is zero. And it's a, it's a trivial check, right? So, so you have this simple identity, um, which is that the, uh, you know, the, this, this true polynomial has a bunch of places where it vanishes. And again, remember, since it's a symmetric polynomial, it's giving us a lot more information, just, you know, it means that, yeah, it's gonna give us a whole bunch of recurrence relations, basically. Um, All right, I guess I want to write something else.
All right. Now, the corollary of this proposition is that, indeed, these this satisfy recurrence relations. And the recurrence goes as follows. And again, I should probably check my notes to make sure I don't get the factors of q and q squared wrong. Um, yeah, so that one is pretty easy. Um, so in fact, let me do it directly using the symmetry of variables. Uh, no, maybe not. Let's just do it. So if you, if you evaluate it at z2, z2 equals q squared z1. Is it this way or the other one? No, q minus 2z1. Yeah. Which is the same as q quad z1. Um, this is equal to the product over k equals 3 to 2n of zk minus q uh, squared this time. If I did it correct, yes, q squared zi. That's uh, a 1. Uh, times the assure of the size n minus 1 in terms of the parameter z3 dot 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 z2n. So it begins to smell a little bit like uh, Corepin's recurrence relations. Um, so why is this true? And why is this, okay, it's a corollary, but it still needs a proof, so I'll prove it. Um, well, the idea is quite simple. Suppose you evaluate two of these to be already, so that means these two already form a, kind of an angle of you know, 2 pi over 3. That means as soon as you have a third variable which forms a equilateral triangle, then it has to vanish. So all of these zeros comes from the proposition. They're telling you that as soon as um, another zk is, is equal to q squared z1, you have z1, Q squared Z1, Q for Z1, and then the proposition applies. And when you have a polynomial that vanishes in, in one variable somewhere, that means it has to have the fa corresponding factor of the form, you know, x minus that root. So, so you already get all these factors for free, but now you realize the following. Um, as a function, okay, this may be a good time to, to remind you of the other definition of true polynomials in terms of semi-standard Young tableaus. So also, small reminder, never hurts. Uh, as lambda n, you can also think of it as uh, the sum over all the semi-standard Young tableaus, which fill of, of lambda n of the corresponding product of, uh, like, of a monomial, which gives you the, you know, the, the labels of each box, basically. So, in particular, if you look at this particular diagram, you note that its width is n minus one, which means uh, any given variable. Um, um, so what do I want to say? Any given variable can only occur at most n minus one times. That means this implies immediately that S lambda n is a polynomial of degree, uh, of degree in fact, exactly n minus one, but let's just say at, at most n minus one uh, in each uh, zi. So that's also smelling pretty good because we had a similar property for um, the uh, um, domain world partition function. Um, but the result is that these factors actually exhaust all the degrees of, uh, um, of Z1. Because once you evaluate Z2 to be equal to Q for, for Z1, that means effectively uh, the combined degree in Z1 and Z2 can be at most. So the combined degree um, in Z1 and Z2 is combined degree in Z1 and Z2 can be at most, is at most um, two times N minus one. And that means there are already here two n minus one factors. That means uh, if you write, okay, I'm running out of space again, so I'll need to, uh, yeah, erase this, I guess. So the conclusion, So let me summarize. Applying the proposition, we have obtained the fact that we know that there are all these factors in, in, in the statement. So it's S lambda n evaluated at z2 equals q squared or q fourth z1 is of the form product of zk minus q squared z1, where k goes from 3 to 2n. And we still have some mysterious polynomial remaining, but the point is that because we've exhausted the degree in Z1 and Z2, that polynomial cannot depend anymore in Z1 and Z2. So it has to be of the form a polynomial of Z3 dot 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 Z2n. We're, of course, we don't know yet what it is, but it's actually very easy now to conclude what it is because we have a polynomial. Um, oh, so for example, what we can do is um, 
S since it does not depend anymore on z1, z2, we can just set, set z1 equals 0 in this expression now. Um, here, so the, the right hand side stays the same. Basically, it just becomes the product of k equals 3 to 2n of zk times the same polynomial. And the left hand side is not too hard because when you have a, this is a very general fact, by the way, when you have a Schupp polynomial and you have a full column which has, the, which has the, the size of the number of variables, there's only one. So if you redraw the, um, the uh, if, if you do it, for example, in terms of semi standard Young tableau, tableaus, you realize that this has with 2n minus 1. And so the only way to fill it when you have only 2n minus 2 variables. Uh, is using so in the, in, is using basically one, two, three, dot 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 all the way to two n minus two. So you have a unique filling of the first column of a semi-standard tableau when the number of variables is equal to the uh, uh, size of the column. In this case, you have to be careful that all the indices have been shifted by two. So this is actually the monomial z3 up to z2n. Surprise, that's the monomial we had here. And what you, you're left with is essentially just lambda and minus one. That means once you remove that column, you get back to a semi-standard Young tableau of size, which has the exact same shape, but is, uh, but is given by lambda n minus one. And that's the statement of the uh, proposition, of the corollary. Well, we're almost done. Um, because you see now that all these properties together are very similar to the Kerepin's recurrence relations. And what I will spare you is to check the actual details of the correspondence. I mean, they're literally the same, but there are, of course, as usual, some stupid prefactors to be taken care of. And I'll just write you the uh, uh, final answer. Uh, maybe I'll erase this. Uh, no. Actually, maybe I'll just put it here. At the end of the day, if you, if you consider the following object, Zn to be, um, so there's going to be yeah, some pre stupid prefactors, like as a sign. There's a q minus q inverse to the power n. And there is a pr product of monomials. Minus n minus 1, or plus 1. n minus, yeah, minus n minus 1. And then you use the, this uh, sure polynomial. And as usual, the correct variables are squares, and also there's some q's floating around, so um, q squared x1 dot 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 q squared xn and y1 and yn. So the key um, thing to notice about this expression is we put, we've put together all the variables. We used to have those x's and those y's. The x's were associated, I forget, with rows, the, the y's with columns, but now we are putting them all together, except maybe up to some power of a q squared occurring. And the point is that, you know, this is supposed to be the, uh, so, you know, this is the final formula. Th I claim this is a theorem that at Q, so this is, again, as usual, I, I keep, you know, for, for this whole story, we have exponential 2i pi over 3. Uh, we have this identity between the uh, domain world boundary condition, partition function, and this true function. But it's quite remarkable because it has more symmetry than you would expect at first. That means if you exchange a y1 and a q squared x1, the expression remains the same. And nobody knows how to prove this directly, as far as I know. This is a very curious uh, peculiarity of this uh, third root of unity, the manual boundary condition partition function. And the only proof that I know is this one, which is quite elementary, of course. Um, so why is this? So why do, do we, in particular, know how to compute now the number of uh, alternating sign matrices? Well, now there's the evaluation of a Schupp polynomial is very easy. You know, the number of standard, semi standard Young tableau is a formula that's known explicitly. You can, of course, you still have to take the limit in this expression, but this is like a, a standard textbook exercise to take the limit in this um, determinant formula and compute the number of uh, semi standard Young tableaus. So if you put everything together, you find that the number ASMs of size n um, is equal to, so there's a prefactor due, due to the fact that our a, b, c are not literally equal to one, they're equal to something like two, you know, there are roots of three floating around or something. Three, okay, I have the actual exact number. So it's actually three to the minus one times this uh, Schupp, Schupp polynomial uh, as lambda n. And the arguments, you know, so we have to take the homogeneous limit, these literally correspond to all equal to one. Um, yes. So with these conventions, you have exactly this expression with 
And you have, again, two n variables. Um, so this is, there's a known formula, you know, this whatever, you, you can use your favorite formula, the hook, whatever formula. I always forget uh, how you compute this. Uh, I mean, what the name of the formula to compute this is, but this is a very explicit formula. And if you do it, uh, you get very explicitly a product Uh, see, wait, I already forgot. I have absolutely no memory. Three i plus one. Yes, sorry. <laughs> right. So three i plus one factorial divided by n plus i factorial, and then you know this sequence can be is like one, two, seven, forty-two, and so on. And this is the famous sequence that uh, appeared many times in this. Uh, story of the alternating sign matrix conjecture. All right. So that's pretty good. We recovered a, a famous theorem in really not so much effort. Um, so in the remaining 20 minutes, I want to talk about other applications of the domain wall boundary conditions. Um, oh, before I close this chapter about ASMs, um, uh, first there'll be one exercise about ASMs. You want to have fun understand the, the connection to other objects like uh, galton Taitlin triangles and stuff like that. Um, also, uh, I should point out that there, there, there is a very different reason to introduce ASMs. Um, there's a very interesting paper which I think is not known as, as much as it should be by, um, so you know, this is a bit, this is a kind of a side remark by Lascou and uh, Schutzenberger in which they explain that the set of alternating sign matrices is the completion of the lattice of permutations with respect to the Bruyere order. So there's a very natural kind of post-set theoretic reason to introduce ASMs. Um, so they're, they're, yeah, they have connections to many different things. Um, yeah, I probably should, should have said that in the introduction as motivation, but anyway, I'll mention, I'm mentioning it now. All right, so the other uh, thing I want to talk about in the remaining 20 minutes is the uh, connection to uh, domino tilings. And that corresponds to another special value of delta, which is delta equals zero. So in a sense, we've done the hard work. Delta equals zero is a much easier story. Um, but um, out of completeness, I, I need to say something about delta equals zero. So delta equals zero means you choose weights uh, such that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So why would you do such a thing? Well, why not? Uh, if you choose a equals b, that gives, yeah, it gives whatever it gives. Um, the reason this point is special is it's in physics, it's, it's, a, it's a free fermion. The free fermionic point of the six vertex model. So this is the uh, free fermionic. And if you're more on the mathematical side, that means this is where you have non intersetic lattice path, or you have uh, uh, this uh, Lindstrom Gessel Vienna formula, if you want, kind of applies to it, and so on. So there's a lot of extra structure there that is not true for general delta. Um, which um, um, allows you to do a lot more calculations. So most, you know, this is true in, 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 irrespective of whether you're considering the domain wall boundary conditions or not, but for, for, for the sake of uh, today's talk, I actually want to talk about the uh, six vertex uh, model with domain wall boundary conditions at that delta equals zero. And so the statement, which I'm gonna show you now, is that the, um, so the six vertex, uh, domain wall boundary condition at that call t delta equals zero is actually equivalent to the problem of uh, uh, random tilings by random domino tilings of the Aztec diamond. So this is a very classical thing, but again, maybe some of you have never seen this before. Uh, of the Aztec diamond. Maybe I should have prepared a slide to show this because it's gonna be painful to do it by hand, but I'll try anyway. Um, so from the point of view of the six vertex model, this you know, condition a squared plus b squared equals c squared is not particularly natural. In particular, this is not the same you know, as delta equals one half. This is not the point where we're computing ASMs. We are doing something different, but um, yeah, as I said, it, it, it's important in its own right. So here's a 
I'm using, uh, wait, where's my bijection? So I want to do more bijections. And I can't find my bijection. Ah, here we are. Perfect. Um, so, so this is another bijection. It's not really a one-to-one -one correspondence. Actually, it's not a bijection. But, you know, close enough. Uh, so the correspondence goes as follows. Uh, so I'll, I'll have my favorite six vertex configurations. Um, and uh, as usual, the correspondence is local. That means I'm going to have those six vertices. Um, type A, type B, and type C. And the rule is that to, to each such um, vertex, so you, in other words, you should think of it as one little bit of your big domain world boundary con condition uh, uh, configuration. And I'm going to associate to this a little patch of a domino tiling. And if you don't know what a domino tiling is, that will be self-explanatory. So, so once again, so yeah, maybe I should have a running example. So I really should do something small, because otherwise I'll screw it up. So maybe three is good enough. Three by three, two is probably too trivial. So, yeah, we'll try a three by three example. This is an improvised. Um, um, all right, so we have those path. So what was my convention again? They started from the bottom or the right? No, the right. And they uh, appear at the, at the top. Yeah. So this, and uh, so I'm only going to draw the path, not the empty sites. You can. Um, okay. How about just this one? Yeah. So that's going to be our running example. And so the rule is that so that there is going to be um, uh, the four, as usual, the, the first four cases. I know actually the first five cases. Yes, the first five cases are going to be easy. Um, so, well, sort of easy. So these, these domino tilings are going to be 45 degree rotated. Yeah, I probably should have just shown a, a slide. That would have been easier. But anyway, now I've started. So the idea is you should, you should glue together all these little patches. And so right means um, this one. And this one should be going up, which means the same one, of course, yeah, this one. Uh, there's one more which is easy, which is this one, which is the double crossing one. Uh, so yes, this one. So how about we already play this game? Um, Oh, actually, this is probably good enough for this example, which kind of sucks, because I should have taken an example which does have something different. OK, so let's do the final one later, and let's just do this example really quickly. Um, so if you do, do it here, what you find is that, uh, should I do it on top? No, this is going to be really messy. So um, So you have those nine little patches. And the rule is that this one is a crossing. Uh, this one is a like this. Uh, same here. Um, next one is the horizontal one, which is this one. The middle one is the full guy, which is this one. Uh, again, the full cross. And uh, hopefully this is going to match up nicely. This, and finally, yet another cross. And a empty one, which is uh, this one. Now, if you do that, it kind of looks nice in the middle. You have those little dominoes, right? Rotated 45 degrees. And you just complete them. There's a unique way to complete them by, um, <laughs> uh, right, by removing not completing, but you, so you get rid of these. Uh, um, at, at every corner, you just get rid of one of these little uh, extra edges, and you, you claim that they're not there, basically. 
and you get indeed a, a domino tiling of this uh, region, which is a Aztec diamond. So in general, an Aztec diamond is pretty much what you can imagine. It's a, a shape of the form. Um, so we rotated, rotated this way, it's always like a staircase. And then at each uh, corner, you basically have like two steps and then a staircase again, and then two, two, two steps. And this picture looks really not so great, but something like this. Huh, doesn't look like an Aztec demo at all, but I hope I haven't offended any, well, anyway. Um, all right, so this example was terrible because it didn't have the last vertex, so how about we choose one which actually did have the ver this vertex, which may or may not occur in size three. Um, so let's see if we can cook up something which does have it, yes. So how about we do instead um, this one, if you don't mind me doing it on the same. Uh, all right, so how about we do this one instead? Um, the advantage being that we have the, the last remaining vertex. Of course, it's going to screw up completely the picture below. But um, so the point is that if you um, if you use this, uh, oh, actually, yeah. How about I redo it separately? Uh, um, so if you use this vertex, you actually have two choices. So this is why it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, and that's exactly why it's a delta equals zero and not the delta equals one. So it's not a bijection like alternating sign matrices. And these two choices, I might as well just give them to you. Um, are the two diagonal ones. So, so here, the key word here is or. You have to make a choice. Um, so it's a, it's a locally, most of the time one to one, but sometimes two to one correspondence. Um, let's uh, see uh, what this does in this case. That means, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna redraw it on top because this is too much uh, trouble. So in this case, that means we had actually now a C vertex here, a, um, C vertex here, and uh, where is my, ah yeah, right. So here, is, here it comes. And now the vertex here, I claim has two choices. You can either put it this way or that way. And I'm, I'm actually not gonna draw it here to, to show you what the problem is. You have a local spot where you actually have a two by two square, and clearly a two by two square can be filled with dominoes in two different ways, either horizontally or vertically. So that's the choice you have to make here. And you have to, so you have to declare it's either this one or that one. But that's great, actually. Why is it great? Let's say you just want to count domino tilings for now. We, do, we don't even want to give any waste to them. We just want to count them, which is you know, most of the time what you want to do. So uh, how about I erase this absolutely horrid Aztec diamond and continue here. Um, what's the uh, conclusion? Well. From this, by, this uh, not quite bijection, you conclude the following. The number of tilings of the Aston, Aston diamond of size n is what? It's not quite the number of domain world con configurations. However, um, given any um, you, you, there is a map which is well defined, which is when you have such a, you know, there's the map ups, up, upwards works perfectly fine. It just happens that sometimes you get the same configuration. So it's, it's still a sum over uh, domain world boundary co condition configurations. Um, configurations. But the only problem is sometimes you get several times the same domain world boundary condition configuration, which means you have to count it with a, a coefficient. And that's fine. We have, we, are, we have Boltzmann weights exactly for that. And so what is the coefficient you, you get for each? Domain world boundary DWBC configuration. Well, each time you have a vertex of this type, it actually secretly came from two different um, uh, Lozenge tilings. So that the weight is simply two to the power the number of uh, vertices of type uh, this one. So that sounds pretty bad at first, because this is not exactly, uh, you know, if you remember, we always assumed that our weights were uh, invariant under reversal. That means we always gave the same Boltzmann weight to, you know, this one and this one, so to speak. Um, so we are in trouble. But, so here comes a, a point which I probably should have said a long time ago, which is that in this case, the C weights, you don't really care whether the, the two C weights are equal or not. So in other words, so that's the final statement and I'll probably, 
had quite a few other things to say, but maybe I'll just, yeah, stop after that. So that's, oops, um, a final remark. So in other words, it, it is, in other words, the partition function in which you, you've, you've introduced this L operator, which has this form which I mentioned briefly where you, you don't have the equal way. So if you had like A1, B1, C1, B2, sorry, C2, uh, B2, A2, that's like saying, you know, okay, fine, we have A1 equals A2 equals B1 uh, equals B2 equals 1. And I, don't, I do not remember which one is which, but presumably, and also C1, so C1 equals 1 maybe, and C2, and C2 equals 2. Right, so it's the partition function where, uh, you know, all, all Boltzmann weights are trivial except one of the C's, but not both. Um, now, so how about I define, yeah, this partition function A1, this slightly more general partition function this way. Um, and this is still, of course, domain world boundary conditions, right, Z n. Uh, now, there's a simple trick that, that, that shows that actually you don't care about the fact that C1 and C2 is different, than, than, than e different from each other. And this is the following equality. This is also the same as this, where you can put C and C here, where C, C is just, let's say, square root of C1, C2. And there's just a little price to pay, which is a tiny prefactor, which, oh, you know what? We're going to determine it by the, in the proof. We have actually time to prove this. We have three minutes, four minutes left. So we act, actually, I'm going to com complete this equality using the, the actual proof. Um, the proof is as follows. Um, there are many different ways of thinking about it. The, one of the ways is, uh, is in terms of ASMs. So remember that domain world boundary conditions are in bijection with ASMs. And um, yeah, the, there are many different languages in which you can do this. So can someone remind me which one of these two is the one and which one of these two is the minus one? Okay, cool. So in terms of ASMs, this was the one, this was the minus one. Yeah. So, um, so this partition function, therefore, you can also rewrite as being, you know, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, as the sum over ASMs. Um, where, um, um, the so, okay, yeah, I guess, so no, let, let's just say some of our domain world boundary conditions, so DWBC, but the point being, so the, the A weights are, we don't care about anyway, but they're whatever they are. But, uh, so the number of vertices of, of, of the given type, but in terms of, um, okay, whatever, so these are gonna be irrelevant for us, but the point is C1, you can think of it as the number of ones in the corresponding ASM, and C2, is the, car, is the number of uh, minus ones in the corresponding ASM. And now there's a simple observation, which is whenever you have an alternating sum matrix, because there's always on each row an alternation of plus ones and minus ones, which starts with a plus one and ends with a minus one, that means there's, always, there's exactly an, one extra uh, plus one per row. That means there's a total of n extra plus ones. So that means this thing can be combined together as uh, C1 to the power, the number of minus ones uh, plus n times C2 to the power, the number of m m minus ones. Well, I used the fact that the number of plus ones was the number of minus ones um, um, plus n, right? And therefore, uh, we can already see what, where this is going. Um, um, no, I probably should have used the uh, total number of, uh, all right, so I, sh I should uh, kind of average out. So how, how about we do it this way? Um, so, the, 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 um, so the number of C, C vertices is the number of ones plus the number of minus ones. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, you know, this is a proof in real time, so that means that there's a bit of fixing that needs to be, to be done. So that means uh, the, uh, which is um, twice the number of minus ones 
plus n. And so, so let me, you know, we write slightly differently. This was not probably optimal. So let's write it dir directly this way. So it's C1 times uh, the number of C's, um, uh, the number of C configuration plus n divided by 2. And C2 to the power of the number of C configurations uh, minus n divided by 2. And all the rest is the same. And therefore, this is nothing but um, the partition function. So this is going to be where we're going to get our factor coming out. Uh, A1, A2, so none of these things are changed. Um, CC, where C is this uh, square root. And then we still have this factor of C1 over C2 to the power n over 2. So this was the factor that was here, which we can now retrospectively introduce. OK, so the basic idea is that it's not really relevant the, the way you assign to C1 or C2 because their the numbers are essentially the same of, of these configurations. OK, so when you do this, that means instead of, instead of saying that we have a factor of 2 for each of these C2 weights, we can also equally well set this up to a prefactors, which can be computed explicitly, which I'm uh, going to, uh, so it's up to uh, 2 to the power minus n over 2. This is the same as the sum over domain wall boundary con configurations uh, of just you know, square root of 2 times uh, the number of C configurations. So in other words, this corresponds to, uh, so we're getting back to our delta equals 0. Um, we have A equals 1. We don't put any weight on the A vertices. B equals 1, C equals root 2. And sure enough, A squared plus B squared minus C squared equals 0. So this is indeed the, uh, uh, you know, this is Z and at delta equals 0, basically. There. Now, um, I think I'll just stop here. It's just on time. Right, so the exercises are only going to be for the last day, right? Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you want, you can, uh, yeah, you can let me know and uh, we'll, we'll post new exercises maybe today. Oh, you want to post them today for? I mean, if, if you have them. I see. Yeah. Sure, yeah, we can do that. I mean, actually, no, we're not ready, but. Well.